Yeah. It's a real pleasure for me to welcome Professor Pranab Bardhan uh, to talk about his, uh, his memoirs. He doesn't like to call them that, but that's an easy word to describe what they are. Uh, Charyavati uh, here today. Of course, Professor Bardhan, as all of us know, is one of the world's great development economists. Um, you know, I think if I say a little bit about his work, it will take me half an hour. So let me just say the following thing. That I, and I show you this is true because I did this once. I did this exercise once. Pick any topic in development economics you're interested in. Anything. Go back 30, 40 years. You'll see a paper by Pranab Bhardhan that started that literature. I'm serious. Yeah. Pick any topic. Macro, micro. Yeah. And of course, his, his, uh, a lot of his empirical work and his ideas have come from India and particularly from West Bengal in India but also in China. So, uh, and, and his India-China comparisons uh, have, have had quite an impact. Uh, his last book, his last academic book was The World of Insecurity, which I would recommend to everybody. I think, I just told him, I think it's his best book ever. I've read all his books. But that one, to me, is his best. Um, uh, so we, we're really looking forward to hearing him speak. We have two wonderful discussions, both my colleagues in the Development Research Group at the World Bank. Uh, anu, anu Kriti is uh, a senior economist uh, in our group. Uh, she used to teach in Boston before joining us and uh, uh, is, is a, uh, works on gender, works on norms in gender, does wonderful work at the intersection of economics and other disciplines. Uh, so it's, it's a real pleasure to have her and I'm sure her work's also been <laughs> And our second discussant is, is, is John Giles, who's lead economist in the development research group. John's claim to flame in this room is that uh, Pranabhadan was his uh, PhD advisor, as he was uh, Rinku Murgai, who was sitting here with us. Um, and He's even mentioned in the book. And, and John is mentioned in the book. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, you know, and, and, but, but beyond that, John, of course, is a labor economist, works on the economics of aging, many other wonderful topics, and uh, largely on China, and, and which is why he, he, uh, he and Pranab connected uh, in grad school. Okay, having said that, I'm just going to open the floor uh, to, 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 uh, and ask uh, Pranap to get started, and then we'll have uh, 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 Anu and John give us about five, ten minute discussion, uh, and then we'll open it up uh, for questions. All of that. Thank you, Viju, for the over generous comments. Don't believe him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my being in all different parts of development economics. Um, and thank you all for coming and those who are listening online. Um, let me start by saying that this book, along with the World of Insecurity book, which Harvard University Press published in 2020, end of 2022, uh, are really products of COVID, <laughs> of those days of uh, house arrest, essentially. I wrote two of those two books. Uh, this book came out later uh, because it was originally serialized in a New York-based blog called Three Quarts Daily, but it's a much revised version of the serialized version. Um, uh, by the way, if anybody is interested, this book is available in Amazon and Kindle that you told me. Um, let me start with the word Charevati, which is maybe unfamiliar to many of you. It's an original Sanskrit word. In fact, by the way, the first paragraph of this book explains uh, the, the word. Uh, it's in a Sanskrit hymn composed uh, between 5th and 6th century BCE. Uh, in the, I think the Upanishad text is called Aitareya Upanishad. Um, Charivati means there, keep moving in search of self-realization. That's the original context of the meaning. Uh, that, so that was 5th and 6th century BCE. About three centuries later, Gautama Buddha, when he used to do his sermons and discourses, every time he used to end with Charivati, Charivati. Those are the last two words of his sermons. Mine is not a sermon, <laughs> the book. <laughs> uh, it's actually full of anecdotes and, and in fact, many of my economist colleagues have saying we should have, have more economics. I said, no, this is not a book meant necessarily for, only for economists. Uh, so 
it's addressed to many other people, uh, not just economists, and uh, there are a lot of stories, anecdotes, etc. But And I'm going to read out some passages which are essentially anecdotes, but just to clear the impression that this is all uh, uh, fluffy style, uh, stuff, uh, there are some serious issues also discussed in the book. Um, so let me start with some of the serious issues. So for example, uh, the book, uh, of course, these serious issues have preoccupied me my whole life, uh, professional life. Large systemic issues are discussed, uh, capitalism, socialism, democracy, uh, that's the title of a Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter book, uh, nationalism. These serious issues are discussed and my position is often not in, uh, in, in line with orthodoxy on these issues. So that's why I need some explanation of my position, but I do discuss them. Uh, but the book is also largely observations on politics and society. It's not, in fact, in my preface says this is not an autobiography. Because autobiography essentially is more about your life and your um, uh, inner struggles, uh, your intimate and non-intimate relations, etc. This book is not really that, uh, although my life is in the background. But it's largely my interactions with others. And then in connection with interactions, my observations on politics and society, particularly in the United States and India, but also Western Europe, parts of the, country, parts of the world that I'm more familiar with. Uh, there is actually a, one whole chapter on English academic life. Uh, my, but I've, been, uh, I've seen the English academic life from close quarters, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, I was a student in Cambridge, and I've, I've, been, I've been visiting fellows in both Oxford and Cambridge. And then many times I've been a visiting professor at London School of Economics. So in that connection, some of them are amusing stories about, I don't know how the English are taken, but <laughs> uh, particularly about Oxford and Cambridge colleges, there are some, uh, some funny anecdotes. There's also a chapter uh, John must have noticed it's on China. My many visits to China, uh, uh, but I've been interested in China right from my childhood. And I mentioned that uh, the, the largest uh, Chinese center used to be in a, in a, in a place where I, I grew up, um, in Shantinigata. Uh, and um, so that's where I start my China connection. There are also preoccupations, or my preoccupations with not just systemic issues, but in a, in a related way with various institutional economic issues. Let me give you uh, some examples. So I, I had worked on, uh, on agrarian institutional issues for a long time. In fact, now uh, when I think about it, tells you how ancient I am. Mm -hmm. My first uh, uh, really serious paper in development economics was a paper on sharecropping, which uh, was in American Economic Review 1971. Um, but, and, and then the whole lot of us were working on agrarian relations. And then, of course, I did a lot of village service, mostly in West Bengal. But not just in West Bengal, actually, I carried out some village service on irrigation relations in Tamil Nadu, in 48 irrigation communities. But most of my village service, except for Tamil Nadu, and I, I also carried out on some deforestation issues in, uh, in the Himalayan foothills. There, the, some service we carried, Billy Bukaji and I carried out. But most of my village service are in West Bengal. Uh, first, I, I did with Ashok Rudra on about 110 randomly chosen villages so that we could generalize about whole of West Bengal. And then later, with Dilip Mukherjee, uh, 90, uh, again, sample uh, villages. 
although it took, took a lot of my uh, time in my professional life. Um, I should pen mention, talking of institutional economics, we were doing this, if you think of my first article, 71, 25 years before institutional economics took, was taken seriously uh, in, in economics proper, uh, in the, only in the 1990s after the Nobel Prize of um, Douglas North, and that too in economic history in the West, um, that institutional economics and then the cross-country regressions of Asimov, Johnson, Robinson. Uh, but we were doing institutional economics a long time before that. And, and that brings me to something that I come repeatedly in my book. Development economics was not taken seriously. The reason our doing institutional economics was not noted anywhere because development economics itself was marginalized. Um, and um, in fact, in 1989, I edited a book, The Economic Theory of Agrarian Institutions, not in a developing country, it's an Oxford, Clarendon Press, Oxford published it. But if you, if, if you even today, if you read, read the survey articles on institutional economics, no reference to the earlier agrarian relations literature. Not just me, there are about 10 other people doing that work, but no reference. Because that essentially, did, developing countries didn't matter those days. Now it does, but uh, the, those days it was completely marginalized. The other institutional issue that has also uh, preoccupied me is issues of collective action. And I mentioned that growing up in a very poor neighborhood in Kolkata, I became even as a, as a, as a young boy, I was grappling with ideas of collective action. There are many things that need to be done in my neighborhood. Everybody will say, this needs to be done, but nobody does it. So get your act together is another name for collective action. So that, is, uh, that has uh, uh, preoccupied me for a long time. In fact, when I first uh, started work on collective action in the local commons, that is a Tamil Nadu study background, uh, irrigation, how do farmers resolve uh, collective action problems of water conflicts, for example. So Eleanor Ostrom, who finally got the Nobel Prize uh, for work on collect hard work on uh, uh, collective action in local commons, told me, and she's a, not an economist, she was a political scientist. She told me, you are the uh, weird economist who gets interested in these things. No other economists. This is early 1990s, she told me. And I said, no, no, there's another economist uh, interested in, and I sh he should have got the Nobel Prize, is uh, Mansell Olson. Mm -hmm. But his is a different kind of... Uh, uh, and also, uh, I wrote a book on political economy of development in India, not just my neighborhood, I think the whole of India, there are a lot of issues which everybody needs need to be solved and the solution is also known. Mm -hmm. It does not get done. That is the origin of my book on the political economy of development. So collective action. So this is also comes again and again in my book. The other, of course, is inequality. I've been so interested in inequality for a long, long time. And this uh, interest became particularly active when I became uh, the co-director of a MacArthur Foundation funded group, uh, uh, a group to study and the costs of inequality. Uh, and uh, in a sense, to challenge the standard economics textbook. Any, un even today, undergraduate textbooks, one of the things that they um, really drill into the student's head, that efficiency and equity, there's a trade-off. Yes, there are some cases of trade-offs, but quite often, efficiency and equity go together. And that was the purpose of that group. And that group, by the way, uh, contained some now famous uh, members. Thomas Piketty was a member. We funded uh, uh, his expensive <laughs> research into the tax archives of France. Uh, and then three other members of that group got the Nobel Prize in Development Economics, uh, Esther Duflo. She was the youngest. She actually, when she was a member of our group, she hadn't finished her PhD at MIT. And then Avijit Banerjee and Michael Krimer all these three members of the group. Uh, but 
at that time, we were primarily do, essentially looking at the effects of inequality. Uh, two other is general issues I want to mention before I uh, read passages from the book is that there was a major transition in my academic life uh, after my, uh, my doing my degree in Cambridge, England. I started teaching at MIT, and uh, I was quite a, uh, and and the reasons why I left MIT. In fact, the day why when I went to the chairman's office and said, uh, I, I'm, I'm going back to India. He said, nobody leaves MIT voluntarily. That's, that's I still remember. <laughs> <laughs> that somewhat inaccurate statement. Um, so I told, what I essentially told him, and this I said in the book, uh, amounts to what lovers say when breaking up. It's not you, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> The key part it was that I, in those days I was essentially doing mathematical economics, uh, growth theory, and international trade um, uh, theoretical models. Uh, and but something was gnawing in, uh, inside me. I wanted to work with data, and uh, I went back to Delhi. I started working with other people's collected data, mm -hmm. national sample survey data, etc. I became unhappy with that, and that brought me to the village surveys. Um, but I should tell you, those days, part of the marginalization, those days, development economics uh, was, in fact, when I decided to go back to India from MIT, uh, I talked to my frequent mentor those days, Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen did not discourage me from going back to India, but he told me, are you aware how much of a big academic gamble you are taking? He said, you can take it that he didn't say it in so many words. He said, this shows you are not serious about economics. You are doing what people used to call not development, area studies. Mm -hmm. And area studies is not taken seriously in economics. Mm -hmm. So he said, you are making a big gamble. You are essentially telling everybody you are not interested in the frontier of economics as it is developing. You are going to some backwaters to do some area studies. Are you aware of the gamble? I said, yes. So I took a big gamble. And having arrived at India, I realized uh, how difficult it is to do um, frontier research. So obviously, we all want to do journal publication those days. Even though I later succeeded in doing development economics in the top journals, in the beginning, it was quite hard. Um, so I do the, all this work send it to a journal, and the editor next day will send it back. He said, oh, this, this you should send to an Indian journal, because I use Indian data. Now, of course, every journal issue you will see some Indian data. But those days, no, no, you don't publish those in, in, in the front-ranking American journal. Another problem was a very concrete problem. I found out the submission fee, non-refundable, is one third of my Delhi salary. <laughs> I once wrote to the executive committee of the American Economic Association. Could you at least lower the fee of people resident in developing countries? So they seriously considered the, the next meeting of the American Associ Economic Association executive committee, wrote back a formal letter. And to this day, I remember that letter, said, we seriously considered your suggestion, and we have decided to reject it. Uh, the reason is that we, uh, we are aware that if you publish in, say, American Economic Review, it, uh, a developing country author right, publishing in an American Economic Review, it raises his or her lifetime income so much that you should be able to afford it. <laughs> I, in fact, when I got that letter, I was thinking of giving it as an exercise to my undergraduate students. Tell me what is wrong with this. <laughs> um, the other is about journals. Uh, 
in the in the Indian Statistical Institute as well as the Delhi School of Economics, uh, where I was teaching, um, the <coughs> libraries would get the journal issues, the current issue of the journal, about two three months later. But it, so suppose I find in the in the latest journal in the library, I find something that on which I have something to say and I don't quite agree. I start writing, and then I suddenly realize. The, all the comments, serious comments, have already been made. But those are pre-internet days. We have no way of knowing who's written working papers on those latest. By the time it comes in the journal, it's stale because everybody has worked on it for some years now. So this, we, we, are, we didn't know about this at all in the pre-internet date. Uh, the difficulty of doing frontier, frontier research uh, was, anyway. Uh, enough of those. So uh, the the uh, in fact Esther Esther Duflo always tells me he says you struggled hard to then public to make publishable articles in this journal. You broke the ground for us. That's what both Abhijit Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo tell me. But we had to uh, not just me several of us. Uh, had to really uh, work very hard to break the ground because otherwise we were not accepted in the front uh, of, these, of the subject. Having said all this rather uh, serious, uh, uh, gloomy stuff, let me now uh, read some passages. There are many, many anecdotes about dozens of economists in the book. Obviously, I don't have time for that. What I've decided, I will read uh, some passages from uh, some other passages, mostly relating to India. But before that, uh, I'm going to read some passages about economists. And I've decided today I'm going to read a passage about first a pioneer in development economics, uh, whom I came to know very closely as a colleague at MIT, Paul Rosenstein Roda. And then I talk about two economists. Uh, who were chief economists in the World Bank. So Rodan, uh, of the senior economists in MIT who I, who I came to know uh, very well, uh, I came to know Robert Solo is the person who actually brought me uh, to MIT. Samuelson I also came to know. I taught a course with Samuelson. But the uh, development economics, uh, the senior uh, MIT person I came to know reasonably well, Rosenstein Roden. He had grown up in Vienna and taught in England before teach, reaching MIT. He had advised governments in many countries and was full of stories. He had an excited, omniscient way of talking about various things. At the beginning of our many long conversations, he asked me, what my politics was like. I said, left of center, though many Americans may consider it too far left, while several of my Marxist friends in India do not consider it left enough. As someone from old Europe, he understood and immediately put his hand on his heart and said, my heart too, is located slightly left of center. <laughs> One of his many stories involved his trip to rural Egypt. He, told, he said that once he was traveling in the countryside in a car in the early evening, he saw a big field in one village where people were gathering for a cinema show. He stopped there and as he walked closer, he saw that the large screen was made of rather thin paper. So he asked his Egyptian companion why it was paper, not the usual cloth screen. The Egyptian said, wait and see. The film started and sure enough, it was a Bombay film where at the beginning, the villain was winning both in the fight scenes with the hero and also in the love scenes with the heroine. As this went on for some time, the viewers were getting angrier and angrier. At one point, they couldn't take it anymore. 
<laughs> they all stood up and with great fury started throwing the little knives <laughs> at the screen, <laughs> which soon got badly perforated. The projector was then stopped and another paper screen was installed <laughs> before the film could continue to its ultimate crowd satisfying end. <laughs> Two chief economists of Devout, uh, I've actually knew many of the chief economists in, in the World Bank. Uh, for example, there are a lot of stories about uh, my friend Joe Stiglitz. Joe and I started teaching MIT together. So I know Joe for many, many decades. Um, I also, uh, the, there are also many, some stories about Justin Nifu Lin, another chief economist at the World Bank. Uh, but let me, st those are, will take me more time. So let me um, read out stories, uh, short ones, two other chief economists. One is Larry Summers. Um, one time I was giving, I was asked to give a keynote lecture at a conference in, in Islamabad in Pakistan, Institute of Development Economics. Um, and I think I chose my topic, those, this is early 1990s. I chose my topic on something that was um, discussed a lot. I wrote, chose my topic on privatization. And uh, at, the World, at that time, World Bank and Larry Summers was putting, pushing for privatization. Larry was gung-ho on privatization those days. So since I have a tendency to go against the current, I chose my topic in Pakistan as pitfalls of privatization. Um, the day of the lecture in the morning, uh, the organizers came to me and said, uh, Larry Summers is visiting Islamabad today, so we have asked him to be your discussant. <laughs> so I more or less knew what Larry's position will be, etc. So. I could anticipate his, um, uh, his uh, issues with me on, on privatization. But when after my talk, uh, Larry stood up to speak, he said, Today, tonight I'm going to be critical of Professor Bardhan for several reasons, one of them being personal. <laughs> He may not remember, when I was a student in his class at MIT, he gave me the only B plus grade I've ever received in my life. <laughs> and then he gave his talk, and more or less on my anticipated grounds, so I, I was quite prepared how to answer him. So when I talk came to me to t uh, reply to Larry, I said, and I quote, I don't remember giving him a B plus at MIT, but today, after listening to him, I can tell you that he has improved a little. <laughs> His grade now is A minus. <laughs> and then I then proceeded to explain why it was not an A. The Pakistani audience lapped it up, particularly because until then, everybody there was deferential to Larry. So that's my story about Larry. Larry, by the way, has never forgotten. He's repeated that story many times whenever in any, any forum that I, I have discussed with him. In, in fact, one of Larry's friends told me, you probably don't know, he probably had to go to a, a, a therapist. <laughs> the other story involves another chief economist in a, in a small way is Francois Bourguignon. Um, this is in Paris. Uh, I was uh, in Par Paris. is one of those cities I like to walk aimlessly. In fact, so aimlessly that once I was stopped by uh, Plainton's policeman, he thought I'm an illegal immigrant. <laughs> asked for my passport. Uh, you know, uh, Paris uh, has a long tradition of these aimless walkers. There's a town, Flanor is the town. Uh, the poet Charles Baudelaire has written on his flannery in Paris streets. Uh, 
Uh, another, which uh, I only came to know recently, and I, I talk about it, is uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau was also flaneur in Paris. So one time Francois told me that after one of your long walks, um, come and have dinner with me. He said, you go to that particular restaurant. So I did go, which is a very old cafe restaurant. And um, once I entered the restaurant, Francois took me and motioned me to sit at a particular place. Once seated, he told me that the place where I was, I was sitting was precisely where Balzac, one of France's greatest writers, used to come and sit many afternoons and evenings in the first half of the 19th century, that old cafe restaurant. And then I, I have, I'm going to skip that, that I've quite a bit, bit about Balzac, uh, he, he's a, he was a great eater also. <laughs> In fact, if you're interested, there's a recent book, uh, uh, Balzac's Omelette by Anka Mulsin. It's about how he, his observations of society were linked with, uh, with uh, food. Um, he, in fact, believed that food could evoke character, atmosphere, class, and social climbing more suggestively than money, appearances, etc. So sitting in Balzac's seat, uh, François and I started talking about uh, literature and economics. By the way, François now is involved in editing a book on economists' attitude to literature, in which I have a piece. Over dinner, when I told Francois that in public life in Kolkata, the city I'm from, a poet or a writer was more valued, much more valued than an economist. He said the same was true in Paris. I then told him about an incident in my life. Once a well-known Bengali writer, poet, friend of mine, Sunil Ganguly, and I were talking, uh, walking in a Kolkata street where every few minutes he would be surrounded by young women asking for his autograph. These were days before selfie. <laughs> While obliging them, he saw me waiting bored on the side. He took pity on me and, say, and essentially told his women that I too apparently was a well-known person. <laughs> At this, a couple of women came toward me and asked me what I did. As soon as I said I was an economist, they turned back <laughs> and rejoined the crowd around Sunil. This put me and my discipline in our place. <laughs> so let me now, the, the rest of the passages um, I'm going to read uh, would be uh, my grappling with data. In fact, there's a whole chapter grappling with life in Delhi and data. data. So this is about grappling with data in Delhi. And these were days uh, I was doing uh, other people's data, not collected by me, but of which India was very, at that time, no, no longer, was a very rich tradition of uh, sample surveys. And the great uh, statistician, who is the founder of that system, was Prashanta Mahalanagush. Some of you may have heard of his name. So, so my first uh, encounter with him. So when I was teaching at MIT, um, one time uh, a very well-known uh, great uh, international trade theorist, Harry Johnson, used to teach in Chicago and he invited me to give a seminar. I went to give the seminar. At the end of the seminar, he said, by the way, there is a famous Bengali uh, statistician uh, is uh, visiting Chicago. We are giving a big dinner for him. Uh, would, would you like to join? I said, sure. I've never met him. So when I arrived there, I saw that he's, uh, he's put me next to Mahal, sit in the table, big table, next to him. So 
when I was introduced, I talked to him in Bengali and I said, um, uh, I, I never imagined coming to Chicago all the way that, uh, that I'll have the good fortune to meet you here. He quietly listened to me and then resumed. He was regaling everybody about his recent trip to China, actually. Uh, Zhu and Lai, Zhu and Lai mm. uh, was telling Mahalanovich that you have developed a statistical system. There's no comparison. Chinese was much backward at that time, no longer. Uh, Indian system has got in complete decay in many ways. So he was talking about his interaction with Zhu and Lai and so on. One time, he turned to me and said, he turned to me and whispered in Bengali, you said it was a good fortune to meet me. Are you interested in a job at ISI? <laughs> I was taken aback and slightly annoyed. I told him, no, I had a good job at MIT. He said, I should not misunderstand him. He was a man of clear-cut words and translating, not given to beating around the bush. He had heard good things about me from Harry, and if I so wanted, I could have a job at AIC, uh, ISI at Indian Statistical Institute the next day. I said no to him once again. To assuage me, he took me to this great Indian astrophysicist home, um, Sydney, Chandrasekhar. Chandrasekhar, I met the first time. All I know is took me to his home. Um, Later, of course, I did join Indian Citizens. <laughs> Nothing to do with Bollard, um, uh, But uh, what I was going to say, Mahalanavish was also not merely a great statistician, founded the Indian uh, at that time. By the way, the, 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 the Living Standard Survey system essentially largely at that time, the beginning, was copied on the National Sample Survey that Mahalanavish uh, established. Um, but the other great thing is that he made statistics, re, uh, India, put India on the map in the world, particularly on uh, sample field survey and things like that kind of statistics. And his fame brought, brought some of the greatest statisticians of the world, economists and other scientists, to Indian Statistical Institute. And now I'm going to read out about one such great scientist. One of the distinguished people who came to ISI, Indian Statistical Institute, and stayed on and became an Indian citizen was J.B.S. Haldane, possibly the 20th century's most accomplished biologist. I remember when as a student in Kolkata, we often went to the ISI library because they had the best journal collection. In that library, I often saw this large Englishman in an Indian tunic with a fat, unlit cigar in his hand, reading Biometrica. I now wish I had the courage to go and talk to this formidable looking man. Later, I read a lot about his eccentric personality. As a Marxist, his, he once claimed that reading Lenin cured his gastritis. <laughs> he said, political dissent led him to leave England. I think he left England around Suez time. Mm -hmm. uh, political dissent uh, led him to leave England for India. But another reason was that he would not have to wear socks. 60 years in socks is enough. <laughs> <laughs> he often experimented on himself. In one of his self-experiments, he suffered perforated eardrums. He later said, and I quote, the drum generally heals up, and if a hole remains in it, although one is somewhat deaf, one can blow tobacco smoke out of the ear in question, <laughs> which is a social accomplishment, he said, and so on. I have many stories about Halden. Um, but the data grappling story that I want to come to is uh, next one. So in those days, I'm running around in one ministry after another for getting their data. Uh, once I went to the office of a particular ministry in, some, in search of some data, which I knew they had. But the officer in charge openly said, 
that he could not show me the data, though he did not give me a good justification. I told him that these data were collected with using taxpayers' money, and since no national security issue was involved, he was duty-bound to release the data. He just smiled dismissively. Then I went back to the ISI office where T.N. Srinivasan was my colleague. T.N. told me in India, when you want something in a ministry, don't go to a lower, lowly office, officer. You start from the top. He said, that's the proper channels. So he said, he called immediately uh, somebody higher up, uh, so high up officer, and told me about this is what I need. And this officer then told me, you come, we'll give you the data. Next day, I went to the same official who had refused me before. But by that time, uh, the, 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 the higher officer already told him. So I, he asked me to go to the, the same person. He was now full of oily politeness and said that it was the great fortune of the ministry that a professor like me was going to make good use of the data. But for the next several months, on one excuse or another, he made it very difficult for me to lay my hands on the data. <laughs> After a lot of running around, I finally got the data, but I kept on thinking, why is he doing that? What is it? Was it his resentment that I went to his boss instead of buttering him up? Was it his way of asserting his passive obstructive power on which Jim Scott has written a whole book called The Weapons of the Weak? Or was it simply that he wanted some bribe from me and no way of knowing? So that is one kind of difficulty faced in official data, etc. <laughs> Occasionally, there are even more unpredictable barriers to research with data in India. A few years later, when I was at the Delhi School of Economics, for big data analysis, I used to send my research assistant to the not, now uh, ancient sounding, the IBM 360 mainframe computer located at a different part of the campus, where after you submit your job on the long queue for a, some regression, statistical regressions, uh, you get the job back after three, four days. Something that you can, by the way, you can do your, in your smartphone in a few minutes these days. For small jobs, there was an antique, even at that time antique, IBM 1620 machine in the basement of the Delhi School of Economics building. One time, I had a relatively small job and I needed the results quickly. So I asked my assistant to take it to the basement and get it done on the smaller machine. She soon came back and said the computer was down. After a few hours, I sent her again, but it was still down. I decided to check myself what was going on and went downstairs. Usually, professors themselves do not, did not go there. So when I was there, the officer in charge rushed to greet me. When I asked what was wrong with the computer, he said, nothing wrong. And why was it so down for so long? He said, nothing wrong with the computer, but they were not to run it when the air conditioner was not running. <laughs> And he did not know why that was. I then went and found the man who was in charge of the air conditioner. He said there was nothing wrong with the air conditioner. But he would not run it as the water tank at the back of the air conditioner was empty. I presumed he was referring to the water-cooled condenser in a large commercial air conditioner that was connected to a water tank at the back. In hot climate, that could be important. Of course, he did not know why there was no water in the tank. By that time, I was desperate. So I went to the garden at the back of the building where the tank was, and it was indeed empty. As soon as the gardener, who lived in a small cottage nearby, saw me, he ran to come and greet me. When I asked him why there was no water in the tank, 
he sheepishly mumbled something in Hindi that I could not catch. By that time, a small crowd of peons and others had gathered around me. They told me that in connection with some religious festival, the gardener had village relatives visiting him and given the water shortage in his cottage, they had come and used up the tap water <laughs> to take their bath. I was dumbfounded contemplating the chain of events. <laughs> the gardener's rural family, through the simple action of bathing, had made a university department's computer system dysfunctional and disabled my analysis of data, which incidentally was about the problems of rural households. <laughs> Is this what they call the butterfly effect in chaos theory? <laughs> That's part of my data stories. Tell me how much more time. I think uh, we're at what, about 120. Uh, if maybe one more story and then we can. Okay, okay. The next story. Um, I used to, I loved, uh, for a long time, I used to, uh, if it's actually that group is still going on and I attend them. A group to study Marx, but uh, the, that, um, that group's uh, belief was that Marx asked great questions about capitalism. His answers were often wrong. We need to analyze, but the questions were great. We need to analyze this question using modern data, modern methods of analysis. So that group, uh, it's, it's, its nickname is a group to study non-bullshit Marxism. <laughs> uh, so there are some very important members in that group uh, all over the world. Uh, so one important member of that group is Jan Elster, no longer a Marxist. He calls himself now calls himself faded Marxist. He is a political philosopher. So it involves him. So one time he came to in he, he went to India. And after his visit, he told me that um, everybody in India was quite polite to him. But he said, tell me, what do Indians really think of us? I said, us meaning what? He said, um, us Westerners. I said, that's very easy. I said flippantly. Indians think you Westerners are technologically and militarily superior, but definitely inferior in terms of morals and personal hygiene. <laughs> he thought for a while and he said, morals I can imagine, but why personal hygiene? I then told him a story that I'd heard from Sheila Dhar uh, in Delhi. Sheila was um, wife of P. N. Dhar, who used to be part of the Kashmiri mafia around Indira Gandhi. But Sheila herself was an accomplished singer and writer of books capturing the bygone ambience of the world of North Indian classical musicians that she used to inhabit. And Sheila's story that I told Yun was about Siddheshwari Devi. She was a great classical vocal singer from Varanasi. When she was at the peak of her fame, she was once invited to perform at the Royal Albert Hall in London. This was her first trip to a Western country. The day prior to her performance, she arrived at the fancy hotel where she was put up. Going to the bathroom there, she was deeply shocked to realize that Westerners didn't wash their bottle. They wiped it with a piece of paper. The next day, when she sat down to perform on the stage in Royal Albert Hall, the thought of singing such heavenly compositions in front of an audience with hundreds of unwashed bottles <laughs> so agitated her, that so agitated her that she wanted to cancel the performance. <laughs> After a great deal of persuasion by the organizers, she barely managed to sing. That's my personal idea. <laughs> That's not probably a good place to end. <laughs> I think I think we've got about half an hour left, so maybe we'll okay. Maybe some questions can come to the audience. 
thanks so much. I mean, the book is full of such stories. It's really, really worth reading. Uh, let me add three small points, uh, what Pranabda has not mentioned, was that I've been to the bank 25 years, and I know for a fact that he was invited to be chief economist of the bank. He mentioned many, many chief economists, which he turned down. Second, he mentioned uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a Colombian economist who, who wooed his wife uh, with, with Pranabda's notes. We have somebody in the audience here, Rinku, who met her husband because they were both students of Ranad <laughs> and, and And third, and this is a little more serious, one of Pranat Vardhan's great contributions to economics, uh, which has influenced me, influenced so many others, is the idea of going directly to the field to collect your own data. And doing, and the idea of, you know, he, he's edited a brilliant book uh, in 1989, I think, on conversations with economists and anthropologists, all about uh, mixing methods and so on, which had a great influence on me. Uh, my friend Parameter is here, who's at, uh, at a technological digital uh, thing downstairs last week uh, in the atrium. And they were selling these virtual reality things to take you to conflict zones. Uh, you know, so that's the World Bank's version of fieldwork nowadays. It used wasn't always the case, but, but Paramadhan represents exactly uh, the opposite. Anyway, I'm now going to pass it on to Anu and uh, Anukriti, who will uh, uh, speak for about five or ten minutes. Thanks, Biju. So if you like these stories, I really encourage you to read the book. It's just full of them. It's so thoughtfully written. It's funny. Uh, you know, you, it takes you basically through the whole trajectory of, you know, Pranav Das career and how, you know, people who, names that we've heard of in books, you actually see the real people behind them. So I really encourage you to do that. And it's, it's written so well that you are actually transported to the places, just like, you know, the garden in Delhi School of Economics, which I've seen. And I, w I went down this rabbit hole when you described the basement, because we used to have a computer lab there. Uh, we had computers, but, you know, we used to work on Shazam. And, you know, I wonder, like, what those uh, equipment look like. But, but it's great. And also, of course, you know, it's, it gives you a whole lot. So he's an interesting person, not just professionally, but also in his interests outside of the profession. So there's a huge range of literature and books that are mentioned. I was very happy to see also a mention of uh, British detective fiction, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, and so, you know, so it's, it's great. Uh, there's mention of movies, uh, there is travel, there's food. So it's, it's overall a very interesting read. In terms of uh, coming back to economics, I think uh, a few things that themes that I noted, which maybe are relevant for this audience, and I just wanted to highlight. So the first of uh, was that you know your your uh, your thought you know on that economics profession has now become very narrow, right? So uh, if you if you look at like people who are graduating today, they become very very specialized. And uh, half the time, we can't even talk to people within economics in other disciplines. So if I went to an IO talk or maybe, uh, you know, a macro talk, it's very difficult for people to even converse with each other. And, and you notice it all the time. And I think that's a real loss for the profession. And I wonder, you know, I would love to hear your thoughts later on why that is. Um, I think one big issue uh, which leads to this narrow focus and uh, sort of we forget even where the profession was several years ago is that we no longer teach students economic history. Uh, so when I was a graduate student, we did not have any course on economic history. I think Berkeley used to have it for a long time, uh, but I don't know if it does. Uh, when I was in my, I think, second year of my PhD, uh, so I was at Columbia and we started this uh, course called uh, Perspectives in Economics. And the inaugural set of people who taught it was George Stiglitz, um, uh, uh, Glenn Lowry and Jeff Sachs and I think the idea was to give students some sense of you know how do all these different types of fields come together how have we landed to where we are I don't know if it's still continuing but I think you know something like that would be really important uh, in give, giving students a bigger perspective the second thing uh, I think is about what Biju alluded to is the value of engaging with other disciplines for economists. Uh, so, you know, throughout your career, you have really like, you know, made an effort to engage with anthropologists, sociologists through these uh, seminars or conferences that you organized or even, you know, the group that you were talking about. But we don't again see, you know, let alone talking to other economists, we definitely don't make much of an effort talking to people in other disciplines. And we see that even within the you know, the research group at the bank, and I think we too has really tried to uh, to address that. Uh, and I think you make a very important point in the book that, you know, we can learn from each other in so many ways. And two concrete ways I think you mentioned is if we are going to the field to collect data, uh, and if you're coming from a completely different context, you really have no understanding of what even the important questions are. How do you frame a particular question when you go to El Salvador versus India to Pakistan, you know? So I think speaking to people who work 
you know, in a more focused manner, for instance, like anthropologists can really inform the type of data we collect. And then once you have analyzed the data, it can really help us understand what are the mechanisms. Why does one thing work very well in one setting, but maybe not in the other setting? And maybe it has to do with context, uh, which we you know, often overlook. And this actually reminds me, so I was at a conference uh, in Boston just this weekend, uh, uh, which was trying to sort of you know, bring policymakers and researchers together in the development space to try to talk to each other. Like, what are the issues you face when, when you talk to the other party? And uh, you know, so we had Michael Kramer, Dean Carlin, all these people. And I think, you know, so, so a lot of interesting things were said. And one thing that I think people overlook is the political economy aspect, which you, of course, have a lot of, you know, uh, uh, of things to say about in the book and through your work. And, and you know, so again, in our discussion, it will be great to hear uh, what your thoughts are, uh, you know, especially since we are at the World Bank, where we really deeply engage uh, with policymakers when we do research. And it's interesting, you know, how I think in the chapter, so I think he has been asked to be the chief economist twice, if I remember correctly, in the book. Uh, and so I think you mentioned these two nice terms. One is that you think of yourself as an interpreter of maladies as a person who tries to analyze what doesn't work and why it doesn't work as opposed to a prescriber of medicine uh, uh, you know which a doctor would do so i think at the bank we tend to do sort of both especially the operational colleagues are more like the prescribers and whereas maybe we in the research group try to be somewhere in the middle and maybe you know uh, be useful to both types of practitioners so again you know it would be really good to hear your thoughts on what is this you know even though you have stayed away from explicitly engaging with policy makers uh, you know through your career through your experience what are your thoughts on uh, especially for people you know like us who are at the bank how how you know you think about that um, and i think the last thing i wanted to also uh, mention is that you know you truly have had a global uh, you know uh, career in the sense that you know what would be most familiar to people is okay you grew up in calcutta you went to cambridge and then you you know had a job at mit and very often what that would mean is either you would stay there or maybe move to other similar universities in the us but you instead went back to the delhi school to isi and then moved back again to the us so this type of i think you know in and out uh, uh, movement is something that at least I don't see happening today and I don't think it's even possible for a lot of people uh, there and it's not just you I think you mentioned a lot of you know other uh, leading economists from those times who would often go to ISI or Delhi School of Economics or the other way around and even though you know we, we now have much it's we live in a much more globalized world it's easier to interact and engage I feel that you know that that back and forth of ideas is, is missing to some extent. And of course, there are a lot of you know, issues from both supply and demand sides, what's happening to say academia and places like India. Uh, but I think that again is something uh, I would love to hear more uh, from you about. Uh, and I think lastly, just you know, what are your some of your lessons from your career for uh, you know, young economists today? Uh, what do you think are still the big questions in development which we tend to forget as we try to become you know, more and more specialized and narrow? Would be great. So I'll stop here. Thanks, Anu. Uh, John? I think I want to uh, talk about the memoir travel log um, in the context of having been a student of Professor Bardot's at Berkeley. Um, I was, um, when I arrived in Berkeley, I was very much drawn uh, and interested in Professor Bardan's work, not only because he was a well-known researcher in the economics of development, but he ha seemed to have research that was connected to a lot of broader political and economic debates and often big questions. So I, myself, I grew up in a family that was very much left of center, but more in a, in a philosophical and psychological sense rather than analytically in their work. And, and, but, um, and, and uh, Professor Bardana just edited a volume on market socialism that highlighted new work on incentive compatibility and incentive problems in, in collective action um, or, and in public ownership. And I was having, having um, lived in China for a few years and, and somewhat recently still back, I was very much interested in the topic of the day, which were township and village enterprises. Um, so I was, um, I, I was beyond simply economics of development, I could see where you know, there, there may be overlapping interests here. Um, I also was aware uh, of uh, the fact that Professor Bardan seemed to promote 
bringing different intellectual traditions together. I had also found the book on anthropologists and economists speaking with each other, and this was something that, that I, I found intriguing as well. Um, and you know, in, the, in the introduction to the field that all new PhDs you know, at, at our time heard a, sort of a, a marketing talk from um, the different fields, uh, Professor Bardan reminded us of, of the fact that uh, the economics of development encompasses really all fields of economics and that economics was born out of a desire to understand uh, the development process. Um, when I was um, uh, finishing my dissertation, I was on the job market and, and in my first couple of years out of grad school, I ran into many people who were surprised that Professor Bardan would have been my uh, dissertation advisor if I was working on labor um, and rural development in China. And I, I thought this was odd. Uh, one, because there are commonalities about, uh, among farm households and issues of institutions um, in rural areas that I knew uh, uh, Pranab was interested in. Um, and as evident in the memoir, he, he has long had a deep interest in, um, in uh, engaging with ideas, with leading economists and, and intellectuals and policymakers from around the world, including a considerable background interest in China, which was, I think at the time, often underappreciated. For at least 30 years, he's been a keen observer uh, with a deep understanding of the intellectual currents there, including you know, current intellectual debates between sort of mainstream economists and a Chinese new left um, that is, is present. Uh, and he's contributed significantly to a small literature comparing uh, the Chinese and Indian development strategies and political economy in both countries. Um, and Again, in his, in his uh, memoir, he notes on ongoing discussions with uh, scholars in China and continuing engagement there, including, I believe, contributions in, on the possibilities and benefits of um, introducing a, uh, a, base, a, a, a basic income scheme in countries such as, um, as, uh, as China and India. Um, you know, and... I want to say, you know, there's a depth of ongoing engagement with the intellectual community here that's evident both in this book, but also in uh, the recent volume, A World of Insecurity, which Martin Wolf at the Financial Times has, had, had heralded as a, a must read for the summer of 2023, which I saw that and ran out and got my copy. <laughs> um, as an advisor, uh, I would say that Professor Bardan gave students their own agency. He was not a bully in any sense. Um, he would often offer suggestions on articles and books and ideas to con consider. And these were, you know, there was an endless stream of them. Um, if you read the academic memoir, you'll understand uh, more than I did at the time, uh, the depth of the background from which he, he, he drew. Um, and he would also provide other kinds of uh, evidence, um, other kinds of, um, of uh, uh, advice and suggestions, always with gentle uh, humor and some amusement. I had one experience um, back, let's say back in the day, uh, grad students didn't often co-author papers with members of their committee or advisors. And we'll say Professor X informed me one day that my job market paper could be much improved if he were to co-author it with me. <laughs> and I didn't like the way this interaction felt. So I went to my main advisor and described it and he chuckled and said, I don't, that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> and then followed up with uh, very simply, well, if you want to write a paper with him, it might help you. But if you don't want to write a paper with him, just tell him, I don't want to do this with you. 
very simple but empowering advice. Um, and um, yes, I, I guess in, 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 I would also say that, you know, your advisor always sticks to you to some extent. And, you know, this may reflect my occasional struggle with deadlines, but in the last two months, I had a vivid, vivid dream in which I received a message from my professor saying, you know, we're still waiting for the third chapter of your dissertation. <laughs> you know, Berkeley's quite generous, but you're, you're kind of pushing it. You might try to get that along to me. And I woke up in a panic, <laughs> thinking, my third chapter, what is it about? <laughs> All right, I can do this. And then I started piecing together history and the fact that, no, everyone signed off on it. I delivered it. It's done. So um, at any rate, I, uh, I would urge people to, um, to read the memoir. And uh, this is, um, you know, I, I'd say most of us don't have uh, such rich interaction across fields and across disciplines and with a broad intellectual history as, as Professor Barton. Thanks, John, and thanks, Anu, for those wonderful comments. Uh, I'm going to mention one uh, comment from, on, from online from Aisha Boy, Boy Bay, who works in water, in water sanitation and supply. And she says that because of your anecdote, or because of that story, the water supply department, the bank, and everywhere else has terminology of wipers and waters. <laughs> Two types of people in the world. <laughs> so, anyway, if, you, if you'd like to respond before we open it up. For... Um... John, of course, uh, it is usual way. It was all praise. Uh, I, I, I sometimes, I, I, in one book event when Biju was present in India, I said that in these book events, I often feel I'm attending my own funeral. <laughs> in funerals, you're not supposed to speak ill of the dead. <laughs> so you don't hear many criticisms. Um, so I will, I, I will uh, try to answer some of the questions that uh, Anu raised. Um, I'm not sure I have all the answers. Um, I think in some ways, um, the yes, economy, economics is quite narrow, and particularly with specialization, it becomes narrower and narrower. In fact, the other day, um, a great uh, British Marxist historian, uh, some of you may have heard of his name, Perry Anderson, this friend of mine, Perry, told me, why is it that earlier we used to hear about these great economists, not just economists, everybody else read those, you know, whether it's uh, Adam Smith or Marx or Schumpeter, um, everybody else read, read them. Why is it today we don't uh, read, others don't read economics, except in open pieces, they probably read Paul Krugman <laughs> and so on. But... Um, I said this is this specialization. Even, you know, for example, if you ask, I mentioned this in the book, uh, if you ask me who's the greatest uh, economist of the, two, of the 20th century, uh, I mentioned that Keynes certainly was one, uh, Samuelson probably is another, but the third, who, whom I personally was very, I mean, met him and he in fact commented on my dissertation, Kenneth Arrow. My regard is really one of the greatest uh, uh, economists. Uh, but the non economists usually don't read him. Uh, Samuelson these days, because he's, he's an undergraduate textbook, but non economists did. It's certainly the narrowness of it. Uh, but today it's somewhat different. I mean, compared to my student days, certainly what you were saying about narrowness was true even then. I think in the internet connected world, uh, today you read a lot more of other, other I mean, I, uh, having mentioned Paul Krugman, I think Paul Krugman is widely read. Uh, in fact, in the dark days of the, immediately after the uh, 2000, um, uh, the 9-11 in this country and then Iraq war, I used to call Paul, whom I knew, in fact, he used to help me in, when I was running a journal of development economics, 
uh, I, I, Paul was the, I called him at one, in one gathering, I said that he's the leader of the opposition in this country because the Democrats were not objecting to the uh, Iraq war or, and many of these other things that the Bush administration was doing. So Paul systematically, every op-ed column, he was bashing, uh, etc. Later, a lot of people went against the Iraq war, etc. But so Paul Krugman, even though he's a Nobel winning economist, most other people were reading him. So in that sense, in the internet connected world, uh, there is some bit of that narrowness is, has dissipated in some ways. But also, uh, it's, it's the, the, I would say that even the interdisciplinary part, we have been doing better today, I'd say, compared to say about 20 years back. A lot more people are now aware of the limitations of economics. Um, so a uh, lot more, so, so just, just one of the new fields in economics for the last 20 years is psychology and economics. Mm -hmm. okay? So the new field of behavioral economics is collaboration with psychologists. So things like that, I would say is a positive step um, in, uh, compared to say about 30 years back. So yes, while that problem that you're identified is very true, but I think there are some positive steps uh, that, that are taking place. Context is something else you mentioned. Now, one of the great things about an economist reading literature, as you mentioned, my book has a lot of <coughs> references to literature because when I left high school, if anybody asked me, what are your big interests? Two subjects, one was literature and the other was history. And I, I, in fact, I described, I wanted to do major in history, but how I transitioned to economics, being interested in history, I gradually uh, came to economics. But literature, I think it goes back to the issue of context. Because quite often in the, not merely in the formula and the theory that we do, but also even in the randomized control, etc. It's very important to understand the context. Uh, I, in fact, had a conversation with Esther Duflo, because as, as you know, I'm, she knows and, uh, that I'm a somewhat skeptical of the uh, randomized control evaluation technique. And I told uh, in our conversation, I, I remember once telling her, that look, um, these, all these masses of people now inspired by people like you are doing randomized control uh, evaluations, but some, well, sometimes they don't have an idea about ground reality as much. And Esther, of course, then talking about her own experience, she had a good idea of the ground reality because before she was doing this, I've seen her myself uh, in, the, in the hot summers of India, she's, spending months and months uh, in the Indian villages. So she had a grasp of the Indian reality and of course then she did that in other countries as well. But that's not true of the, her fellow uh, researchers of the, of the ground reality. And the reason I mentioned in the, in, the, in the case of context is that even reading the literature gives you an idea of the context. In fact, there's a whole field called literature as social commentary. And many of the questions that come to your mind, because I started reading literature long before I became interested in economics, but when I started reading economics, uh, those, those issues that I read in literature, by the way, that, that reminds me of something that I already mentioned. Um, uh, Francois Bourguignon is one of the people, uh, one of the co-editors of a volume uh, they are thinking of bringing up on lit. Uh, I think they gave, originally gave it a name uh, called fictionomics, fiction and economics, how they interact together. So I uh, I was asked to write a chapter in that book. There are many other people who are writing chapters in that book. How from a book of literature you got economic insights. So I chose a <coughs> Bengali uh, novel in Bengal, quite a famous novel of the. The novel is about a, a very backward rural community. By the way, in Latin America, in that connection, I read up 
Latin American literature, there are some very similar kind of examples of, for example, I, there is a, I forget his name right now, in Guatemalan uh, writer who got the Nobel Prize in literature many years back, uh, is of a very, you know, remote community, and the problems they faced, etc. And then when I did development economics, I could then think of the context of some of the development economics things that I, I was writing about. But literature gave me a kind of feel. Uh, so context, I think that's where the literature issue becomes uh, very uh, important. Political economy, of course, has been there a long time. In fact, the earlier classical economists were, they didn't call it economics, they call it political economy, whether it's Adam Smith or David Ricardo or Marx. They were writing political economy. I was fortunate that in the undergraduate college uh, that I went to in Kolkata, uh, at th those days, economics was not a separate subject. It was economics and political science. So I did as much political science as, as economics in my undergraduate training. Uh, so I've been interested in all that. I call myself a political economist. I'm not just an, uh, just an economist. Uh, so yes. And that brings to the issue that you mentioned about uh, policy. Yes, I, and this is probably my problem. Danny Roderick, uh, when I was giving a talk at uh, Kennedy School, he said, in Kennedy School here is a, a school of economic policy, and you are saying you are not interested in policy. I said, no, I'm interested in policy, but I'm not just well equipped, I feel. And the reason, so I've never advised governments, except one very small exception, I've never advised any government. I feel kind of diffident in advising government. But of course, again, being in a World Bank, that sounds very strange. Uh, all I essentially wanted to say in this is that policymakers often give advice on policy without being sufficiently aware of the political nuances and the context. Uh, and that's all I mean. I mean there are good policy economists who are, who are aware of that, but I just want people to be. And the other thing that always um, had, had uh, drawn my attention, economists tend to overestimate their value. <laughs> they, they think this politician is listening to them. They don't often realize this economist was chosen because he knew that you would be advocating a particular policy. He chose you rather than another person because of that reason. So you are being used. And what is the expression that Lenin used called useful idiots? So economists are often the useful idiots for politicians. I mean, that's probably exaggerating a little bit. Uh, there are many things the, uh, politicians uh, can learn from the economists, but I think economists should not overestimate. But having said it goes both ways. If you remember uh, Keynes's famous uh, description of the role of economists, um, Keynes said that economists should have the humility to think of themselves giving a service like the dentist. That's the expression he used. Dentist. You have to take. You go to the economist, he can help you there. But nothing more. Uh, I told that to Esther Duflo because she has used a different expression. She said, Economist value is like a plumber. So you have a plumbing problem at home, economists go and fix it. I told Esther, I remember, I said that, yes, Keynes' dentist comment and your plumber comment are quite similar. But yes, an economist should, be, should have the humil humility. That I completely agree. At the same time, think of Keynes himself. He did not remain satisfied just being a dentist. He tried to save capitalism. So he was doing big things. So you can try to think big, but in thinking big, you have to be interdisciplinary and history conscious, politics conscious, and all that. Um, I'm going to skip your last question, which will take a whole hour. Big questions in developing economics. I'm going to uh, uh, skip that. Um, on the last, so the last comment I'm going to make uh, in response to you is about this moving back and forth that you mentioned that, yes, I've constantly moved back and forth, even though 
when I took my job at MIT, uh, sorry, in, in Berkeley, after going back from Delhi School of Economics, um, uh, the, uh, one of the advantages today, again, uh, compared to earlier days, this back and forth has become much easier. Mm. Uh, not merely in your, in sitting in your ro room, you can know what's going on. I mentioned that we didn't know in, when I started what's going on elsewhere. Now it's just a click of a button. Uh, you, you know what's going on where. Uh, I carried out some of my later village surveys with uh, Dilip Mukherjee when I was teaching in Berkeley. So I was going again and again to these villages. Um, uh, so it is possible to do now. We have the resources. We now have a lot more. As I so when I started, field surveys was something uh, regarded as weird for an economist to do. Now, you know, that gives you a Nobel Prize, as, uh, as Abhijit Michael and uh, Michael did his uh, uh, work in Kenya. Uh, Abhijit in, uh, and, and Esther did uh, India and elsewhere. Uh, so, field surveys are much more valued today. So, um, for, for, for economists. So, it is possible now. So, I'm saying things are hopeful. Yeah, there are problems, one should be aware of them, but I think things are, mo uh, are moving in a positive direction. Let me stop here. Thank you, Pranab. We have about uh, four minutes, so I will take at least one question. Any questions? From the audience, Armita. Um, so yeah, this is not. Oh, sorry. You see, before you, there's one comment from Aisha Barbia. The, the name of the uh, Guatemalan uh, writer who came is Miguel Angel Asturias. 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 So here's my question to you as an intellectual. So in your personal story, I saw great reflections of courage and risk taking as an intellectual. Uh, so I would like to hear your reflections on that, which also ties into your own examination of institutions as intellectuals, scholars, academics. We all operate with academia as an institution, which ties back to Anu's questions about how academia may have changed, which probably is making it more difficult for younger scholars to take decisions that reflect courage and take risk. So what is the role of risk taking and courage in academic professions? All professions require risk taking. Uh, and certainly economics does. When you make it, you see, when I left MIT at that time, I was publishing in all the top five journals, etc. But I was dissatisfied. But this is what I said, the Amartya Sen made me quite aware that you were taking a big, big risk. Are you aware? Now, maybe I was not fully aware, otherwise, probably I would not have taken it. But, uh, uh, but risk taking is there always. I would say there are some ways in which risk taking have become, uh, in some ways, easier now. Because of this recognition that I mentioned in response to Anu, that interdisciplinary work or just moving back and forth is now much more accepted. So to that extent, it's, but as I always uh, often hear, you do it after tenure, right? That, that's the usual advice that many risk-taking things you do after tenure, not before. Uh, the, uh, this may or may not be always true, but yes, that, that, that certainly uh, is something uh, quite often, um, even in the case of graduate students, this is important. Uh, so like, uh, so a graduate student supposes a choice of doing research in an area which is very interesting, but at that point, we're not yet ex ante, you are not sure it's going to give you a journal publishable paper. Whereas that's, as opposed to that, there's something else in which, yeah, if you plot along, you will have a journal published. So the graduate student <laughs> take the second, not the risky one. But then at some stage, it should. So I think it's a matter of how you, uh, stage it and different people face it in different contexts. I just gave my case of I took a risk, but I also at the same time I'm calling it a risk, but at the same time the, the worst possible situation is not that bad. I, I was going to end up having a reasonably safe, comfortable job in India. That's all. I'll not be able to publish. The, the, the bad side was that I'll not be able to publish 
in any of the front ranking journals because my life but still would be reasonably comfortable. So yes, it was a risky decision on my part, but not that. Disastrous risk. People all the time taking more disastrous uh, risks. Uh, life, uh, I, since I've seen the poor from very close quarters, they're taking risks every day. And those are life and death risks, not the kind of risks that you and I take. Um, yeah, that's my kind of fumbling answer to you. Thank you, Pranabda. Thank you for all of you for attending and for Don and Anu for your wonderful discussion comments. Thanks all to all the online participants. I will see you at dinner tonight. You are coming to dinner. Yes, I will also see you for dinner tonight. Great, great. You're not coming to my other talk. Give me I so Bichu, I don't know. I think you'll send me the link to the other talk. I'm not I'll sure. I'll send you the information. Okay. I'll send you I need some Indian corporate capital. Uh, <laughs>